we bought stuff out of the way. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you out this morning. It's good to see all the hear all the all the chat and all the noise that's going on. It's good to have a good crowd out this morning. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, you're very welcome, and we hope you'll uh, enjoy the fellowship with us here this morning. And um, please don't rush away afterwards. There's a cup of tea out in the cafe area there, so please stay behind afterwards. Have a cup of tea or coffee, um, and enjoy. Continue to enjoy the fellowship with us. The re-announcement sheet there is, is there with all the various bits and pieces and details that are going on during the week. So please have a look at that, and if anything it, it takes your interest, um, please note the time and, and you can go down and enjoy what, what all your activities are. I just want to highlight a couple of, of those today. Um, the Just for Men meeting or visit this week, we're going to the Orange Heritage Museum, and it's this Thursday, 22nd of October, and the cars leave, leave the church sharp at 6.30 p.m., so uh, please get down here for that if you need a lift up. It's five pounds and it includes light refreshments after the tour. Um, now we had a wee sign up sheet, but it's gone missing during maybe somebody's tidied it up. If it's lying around anywhere, please, if you, if you know where it is, please um, give it back to David Martin or he's looking for it, he's crying for it, so he is. Um, but if you, if you haven't put your name down, you can still go, just make sure you turn up at half six um, on Thursday and you'll, I'm sure you'll enjoy the tour. The other thing is that um, Dave and Helen Smithers have issued their wee monthly prayer letter and it's available out there in the, in the foyer there, so um, grab a copy on your way out. just want to welcome Lorna, to, thanks for coming along to play today for us, um, and also Ivan, Ivan Ferris has been with us before and preached to us, um, so we look forward to what he's going to have to say and I'll just invite him to, to come up now. Thanks Ivan. Thanks Martin. It's good to be back. Uh, I was here a month or more ago. It doesn't feel that long ago. Uh, and at the time, Danny said to me, keep the 18th. And that was it. <laughs> so I, I sent him a message during the week saying, is Sunday still on? And he said, oh, yes. <laughs> so it is good to be here. Um, the psalmist says in Psalm 20, verse 7, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Psalm 56, he writes, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 14, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And that's why we're here. We're here to put our trust fully in the Lord, which we should have already done, and we're here to glorify him. We're going to sing now, All Heaven Declares.
Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come in the name of your Son, Jesus, and we come with those words ringing that we will gladly bow the knee and worship you alone. You are creator. You are God, awesome, holy. You are the one who put everything in place. You designed us to be in relationship with you. And Father, you did not stop at that. You didn't just make and leave. You gave us free will. We turned our back on you. Wanted it our way. And you still loved your creation. You still cared And you sent your son Jesus to die to bring us back into that relationship. And so we can gather here this morning. We can gather and acknowledge that you are through Jesus' death and resurrection our Father. Our Heavenly Father. We can acknowledge that you want to bring us into not only that relationship here. But eternity with you. And Lord, if we are totally honest, that blows our mind. Why would the Creator, the God of everything, want to have a relationship with us? Father, at times we let this world get on top of us. At times we are frightened of what may be ahead. At times we have done things by knee jerk. We've done it our way and not your way. And this morning at this time, at the start of this time of worship, we come and we open up our hearts and our souls to you. And we confess the things that we have done wrong. And we confess them knowing that you are a God who loves a repentant heart and who will forgive us. In fact, you have already, in bringing us into your kingdom, into the church of your son Jesus, you have forgiven past, present, and future. Lord, we pray that you would open up our hearts so that we would love you the way you should be loved. Open up our eyes and our ears this morning so that we may see and hear you in everything it does happen and open up our mouths that we may praise you and glorify you. We ask in your son's name. Amen. We're going to sing again. Beautiful one.
It's a bit discerning. Whenever you're standing here singing and everybody's looking at you. Well, they're not looking at me. They're looking above my head. I know that. At my height, it's easy to look above my head. We're going to turn to God's Word. We turn to John chapter 4. And we're going to be reading verses 1 to 30. John chapter 4, verses 1 to 30. This is a passage that we'll know. It's a passage that I'm sure we have heard many times. And it's a passage that recently I was brought back to time and time again and saw with different eyes. And I'll say a bit more about that later. Let's read God's word. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, You have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his flocks and herds? Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, Go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right. In fact, when you say you have no husband, the fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples returned, and were surprised to find him talking with the woman. But no one asked, What do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Amen. And we pray for God's blessing on this reading of his word. Let us pray. (laughs) 
Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads in your presence, we give you thanks that we can come here this morning. We thank you for the freedom of being able to join together as members of the church of your son, Jesus. And we remember as we meet here those throughout this world that do not have the freedom to meet. We think especially of those in Syria, in Afghanistan, Iraq, and where the established church at times can be seen. And yet, on many occasions, the persecution away from the spotlight goes on. And Father, we thank you that many are still coming despite the threat of death. Many are still coming to seek your Son, coming to know you. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would ask that the Holy Spirit would continue to be with them. Surround them with the love of the Father. Surround them with protection, spiritual as well as physical. And continue to open up their lives so that it speaks of you and draws others to you. We think of those that are on the move. And we think back and we give thanks that the early church during persecution was on the move. And in that they spread the word. Lord, we pray for that church as it grows. In those countries where it will, they will claim that they have nothing to give to your son Jesus. And yet a church grows. Lord, we pray that you would be with us. And in our freedom, we would exercise that. And we would share the news of what you have done for us. So we could see the church growing. We pray for those that are unable to be with us this morning, but would love to be here. Those awaiting tests from hospitals, those who are ill, those that age has just caught up on them. And we pray, Lord, that in all of the circumstances that anxiety would be removed from them. They would know the continued closeness of you always with them. And that we would care for them, not just in prayer and in word, but in that desire to drop in and be with them. Teach us, Lord, how to show your love. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing again, Man of Sorrows, the traditional Man of Sorrows. <laughs>
I wonder what kind of books do you like to read? Do you like to read ones with lots of words? Many people read the dictionary. There's lots of words in it. Or do you like ones with lots of pictures? Even I get it wrong and it's my slides. I've got it this time, Mary. Yeah, the Bino and the Dandy. <laughs> pictures, my kind of books. I wonder, many people thought I was going to ask you, who likes romantic stories? <laughs> or adventure stories? I wonder, have you ever heard of Christian fiction books? They're books that have a, a scripture line running through them. But the rest of the conversations, the details are from the mind of the reader or the writer. They're written down what they think happened to tie events together. Just over a month ago, Heather, my wife, recommended that I read a series of Christian fiction books known as Facts of Faith Trilogy. And they start in book one with Pilate asking a centurion named Alban to investigate the claims that Jesus had risen again. And he called in the centurion and he said, find the men who were on guard, find out what exactly happened. And it works right through the three books and at the end we have the story of Saul being converted and becoming Paul. And you know, as I read through those three books, I could clearly recall on a number of occasions the offense and the acts of the apostles that the writers were using and retelling. It was so clear. And also, at times they brought in as background the offense of lives changed by Jesus recorded in the Gospels. And it just seemed so clear. We talked about him, we sent about a friend and how she would find it difficult reading through those books because she would be continually going back and reading the stories in Scripture because it clearly <coughs> brought them out. In the final book of Damascus Way, the story forced me, the writers forced me, as they touched on what happened in the town of Sychar, to go and reread the passage that we read here this morning. I thought I knew this passage. It's well known. I'd preached on it many times. But the question that they were forcing me to answer was what do I know about the person who is the center of attention at the well? For maybe the first time, it forced me to see the individual who met Jesus and not just a Samaritan woman. And I wonder many times in life, we see a person, but not the individual. We see a label and not the actual individual. We knew that Jesus and his disciples were traveling from Judea to Galilee and they took the direct route, which really was off limits to decent Jewish people. You see, decent Jews never went through Samaria. They never took the green route. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? How many traditional routes do we have and we'll never take a green route? Decent Jews always traveled around Samaria. They never thought of going through it. And yet Jesus and his disciples, they travel through Samaria. They travel right down to the come to the town of Sychar. It was midday. It was hot. It was time to rest. It was time to get refreshments. And Jesus waits, waits at the well while the disciples go to buy some food. We know it. Verse 7 then tells us that a woman appears to collect some water. 
And I wonder, do we ever ask those questions? What's she doing here at this time of day? No, you got water early in the morning when it was cooler, not during the warmest time of the day. Nobody else came to get water at this time of the day. You know, as I read this passage and I look at this woman, especially the comments in verses 15, 17 and 18, the word that comes to my mind is <coughs> alienation. I, I get the feeling that she is here at this time of day because she feels alienated, isolated. She has become withdrawn. She doesn't want to meet other people. Her self-esteem has collapsed. Gone. She's had enough of their snipe remarks, their accusing stirs. She knows the gossip. Verse 15 tells us that if collecting water wasn't necessary, she wouldn't come out at all. You see, this poor woman believes that everyone is against her. No one is on her side. And I wonder, friends, as we look at verse 18, I wonder, would you be her friend? Or have we joined those judging her? And we're judging her due to the fact that she's had at least six men. Not the type of person we want in our area. I'm sure if we're totally honest, there would be those who say, slap it into her. She should be alienated. And yet, the religious laws of 2,000 years ago can justify the five husbands. If we read Genesis 38, verse 8, And Deuteronomy 25, verse 5, Matthew 22, verse 24, and Mark 2, 19, Luke 20, 28. We discover that if a man dies leaving no son, then his brother is expected to marry his widowed son-in-law or sister-in-law and have a son in his brother's name. And that can continue down. And therefore, five husbands may not be a big deal. But living with a sixth, oh, come on, Evan. Hmm. Surely that paints a different picture. I wonder, have you ever felt alienated? <coughs> felt as though you're treated as an outsider. Felt that you didn't belong. Being the target of snipe remarks. Gossip. hurting, whether it's justified or not, and you become a football, something to kick. That's how you feel. And friends, I think that's the <coughs> same mindset place that this woman is at. <coughs> the details aren't the important bit, it's the labels. And I wonder, are there those here this morning who is feeling uncomfortable, feeling they don't belong? They have to be here. I wonder, how would a stranger feel coming in here this morning? How would a person who doesn't come to church feel coming in here this morning? I know Martin and Elaine through Nightlight, and a long, 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 long time ago before they got involved in Nightlight, Way back in 97, we went on a training weekend. And one of the exercises we had to do was we had to go into a club, pub, and get a photograph taken with a member of the opposite sex, play a pinball machine, get money enough for a cup of tea. There was a number of things. And yeah, we felt uncomfortable. For the majority, it was not a place they normally frequented. Well, none of us normally frequented. 
And I wonder, as we learned that lesson and how we were welcomed then, do we see the same? You know, it's the labels if you don't belong. You're not welcome. You're not wanted. You're not one of us. They're the ones that hurt. They're the ones that turn people away. And if we're honest, we'll admit that we place all kinds of labels on ourselves. And on others. Of course, every one of us here is alienated from God. And we're alienated because God makes it so clear that all of us have sin and are lost. That sin brings about spiritual death. It makes it clear that we can do nothing from within ourselves to please God or be saved. You see, this woman comes to the well at this time of the day because of alienation. She comes expecting to be alone. She discovers Jesus there. And there's this potential that her worst nightmare is about to begin. There's a man at the well. He's a Jew. He wants her to get water to drink. He knows everything about her. And I can imagine panic building up in this woman. And yet, and yet I see acceptance. You see, Jesus broke all those expected rules. By asking for some of the water to curse at uh, the Francis thirst, he was actually relating to her as a person, not a Jew talking to Samaritan. And even though she brings up the Jew Samaritan divisions, we see Jesus moving the conversation to more personal levels, physical and spiritual personal levels. But he does it factually. There's no accusation in there. You see, friends, what we see in this passage is a two-way conversation. It's not a one-way lecture. I believe that as the discussion continues, that feeling of alienation is being eroded. And yet, this is not the normal expected exchanges you would expect on the first century between a male and a female, between Jew and Samaritan. It just wouldn't normally happen. We find Jesus showing that he cares about this woman both on a physical and a spiritual level. And although at times she doesn't fully understand what he's talking about, she is stuck on the physical level while he's on the spiritual level. She understands who he is. Verse 11, she shows how much that she is away, not picking everything up, when she says, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? This woman hides in her house. She sneaks out for water when certain and no one else is going to be there. She's feeling alienated by everyone and everything. And yet when she meets Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who offers all of us eternal living water, she knows that she's been accepted by God. Verse 19, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Earlier I said that we could be in the same mindset as this woman. Because the details aren't the important bit. It's the label identity. And throughout the Gospels we see Jesus interacting with and we see him seeking out from society those that the church, those that society saw as unclean, outcasts, not acceptable. At his birth the good news was told to shepherds. Read that in Luke chapter 2. Well, shepherds weren't sort of top of your list, but they were down near the bottom of the list. He called men who wouldn't be seen as normal candidates to be spiritual disciples. Fishermen in Mark 1. Tax collector Matthew in Matthew 9. 
He spent time in the company of undesirables like Zacchaeus. Hey, what are you doing up there? Come down, I'm going to your house. Many times the accusation was thrown at him. He spends time with prostitutes and sinners and tax collectors. He touched lepers. And it's that same Jesus who this morning is seeking to individually meet with each one of us. You won't like this, but we're on the Sarables. We're outcasts. We're sinners. And he wants to remove those labels. He wants to remove the feelings that are stopping us from knowing his acceptance. You know, isn't it good to know that just as he made that journey to Sychar to meet this woman, he also made the journey with the sins of the world to that tree of Calvary. He accepted that we needed to be reunited with God, his Father. And our sins, all of them, were causing alienation. They were blocking that reunification. And so he took them upon himself. And I wonder, have you accepted the sacrifice he made? He made it to allow us, you and me, to have that relationship. Have we accepted that? Have we accepted the cost? And why? And I wonder if we have, how do we deal with people around us? Do we view them from a physical position or do we see them through Jesus' spiritual eyes? Now, what about them out there? In this story, we've seen alienation, we've seen acceptance, and finally, I see an ambassador. The disciples were away getting food in this air, right back from time at the shopping. She leaves her precious water jug and she runs back to the town. Well, first 20, it doesn't say she runs, it just says she goes. But some of the first says she hurries back. And considering the type of person we met back in verse 4, that response doesn't seem out of place. It could be uncomfortable for her meeting 12 more Jewish men. Men that might judge her. And yet whenever we read verse 29, we discover that's not the reason for her going into town. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? It's not what we expected, is it? She didn't seem to be the outgoing ambassador type. We see in this woman's action something we don't expect because we see the effect that meeting Jesus had on her life. This is a woman who so much wanted no contact with anybody. She wished that going to the well was going to be unnecessary. And she goes running to tell people it couldn't have been easy. Her deliberately making contact with people that she previously hid from. And I would expect that her new role as an ambassador for Jesus was going to require some very hard actions. Actions like forgiving those who have caused her hurt. Actions like publicly coming to terms with what was happening, facing up to the hurts of her past, sorting out her family position. None of that's going to be easy. And yet, her first priority is not what do I have to do to sort out the past. She'd met Jesus, the past was sorted, and that he was forgiving her. Her first priority was sharing the news. Encouraging others to come and to meet Jesus. No one had told her to do it. We don't see that written down where she went through the course. 
this is what you do, and then you do this, and it doesn't happen. No one taught her how to do it. The love of knowing Jesus the Messiah had led her to openly share what she felt inside. It it couldn't stay in there. The embarrassment is nothing compared to the joy of knowing Jesus. You know, when we read through Scripture, we find many who Jesus had contact with, and they want to share the news. Even back as a baby, the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, verse 18, after they left that manger and that room, they went and they told everybody. The leper in Luke chapter 5 went giving thanks. The man at the pool of Bethsaida didn't keep it quiet. He told it out. And of course, the New Testament writers, they wanted people to know their story. And rather than rely on it going from word to word, they wrote it down. That's why we've got it. And yet, friends, I wonder, because since Jesus' actions on the cross are well documented in the Bible, we actually have no excuse. We know even more than what they did. We know most of the whole story. We know the depth and the cause of God's loving grace. We have no excuse for not fully taking it into our hearts and not just leaving it up in our heads. And I wonder how important is it to us to share the good news to others. I want you to think back. And for some, that's going to be hard. Admit that. Because it's maybe a long time ago. Think back to when you first became a follower of Jesus. How did you feel then? Do you still feel the same? How important is it for us to share the good news with others? We are Christ's ambassadors in 21st century East Belfast. And that won't be easy. It won't. But that's what we're called to be. That's what we're called to be. Let me finish with this one question. <clears throat> Where are you this morning? Are you feeling alienation? Are you wrestling with that offer of acceptance? Or are you employed and learning the role of the ambassador? Lord Jesus, you come and you touch lives. And those lives are never the same. We feel saddened when we know of those that come through our Sunday schools, come through organizations, come through the doors of this building. And hear of your love, of what you did on that cross, the depth of grace and yet turn their back and become hard. And that saddens us. And we think back to the day that we came to a realization that as sinners we needed you. And we say sorry because the shine has been rubbed off that. Busyness of life has taken priority. And so this morning we pray that as we look at this individual, as we look at this woman of Sikhar, and we see how meeting with you caused her to run 
Ignore and forget the alienation because she's been accepted by God as a person of value. And she wants others to know. Lord, may we know the movement of your Spirit in our lives. May we have the protection and the strength to share our story of your love for us with those that we meet. And may we see East Belfast being turned upside down for you. Lord, that is our prayer. Amen. We're going to continue to worship God as we bring to him our gifts and offerings. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come and we bring to you <coughs> gifts of gratitude. We bring offerings to show how much you have meant to us. You have given us absolutely everything. And so we come with these gifts, we come with our lives, and we give them to you and you, seeking your blessing and your guidance on how they may be used for the advancement of your kingdom. Amen. We finish with our final hymn, I place into your hands the things I cannot do.
And now to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.